What's up, Daniel? Hey, my day's going okay. How's your day? Hey Seth, my day's been all right. Good morning, Teddy. Hello there, Morgan. Hi, Jessica. Thanks for saying good morning. Hello there, Joseph. Thanks for tuning in this morning. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Hello there, Rhea. Hello, Caitlin. Hannah, hello. Uh, I'm doing all right, you know, hanging in there. Trying to do the best job that I can. Um, you know, just been super busy. I'm starting, as you can see, just from the circles that are starting to develop under my eyes. I, I just work really, really hard, <laughs> and so I'm tired. But um, but I'm hanging in there. I'm doing all right. Today's my long day, so I got to teach the. I got to teach the college class uh, until 9 p.m. tonight, but. We'll make it happen. Nothing a little hard work can't fix. All right, well, um, no time like the present. So let's just jump straight into what we need to talk about today. I'm going to swap this over here. Are my college classes fun to teach? Um, they're more fun to teach in person, to be honest with you. Um, just like teaching, just like, um, just like high school in some sense, you know, like 
I would rather, to be honest with you, I'd rather if we had we had actual live interaction in class, because um, that's part of the fun part of the job is, um, you know, interacting with students and developing rapport with kids and stuff like that. That's one of the cool parts about the job, which, you, you know, with even with Zoom, you know, a lot of times kids don't put their cameras on and stuff, and uh, which I get. I mean, I get it, but but it's just like you don't, you just don't quite have the level of um, personability, you know. I think that you, you know, you guys listen to me talk and you get a sense. But even online, you know, it's just it doesn't. There's certain. Um, there's certain things that it's like online, it's more to the point, it's more, I guess in some sense it's more efficient because I waste less time online probably. Um, because in class I have a tendency, because you're like, you know, in interacting with kids in the middle of, uh, in a, of a class and you're joking with each other and you have a tendency, I have a tendency in class more often to get off topic, but doing the online lectures, I actually am a lot more efficient with my time because I, I stay to the point a lot, a lot more and I get through things faster. So I guess that's an advantage, but, but in general, like it's less fun, you know, it's the more, it's a lot more fun when you actually have kids, uh, sitting in front of you and you can joke and hear kids laugh and stuff like that. You miss out on that aspect of things. So, um, anyhow, Hello there, Nandini. Thank you for joining. Kayla, hello to you. But yeah, the college classes are fine. Don't get me wrong. Like, the college classes are cool. Particularly, actually, my Saturday morning college classes, like you guys, they're, like, really communicative. They say hello. You know, they ask me how I'm doing and stuff like that. And for me, that goes a long way. Like, there was literally, for first period, there was literally not one comment from the time that I logged in to the time that I logged out. Not a single question, not a single hello, not a single goodbye, nothing. It was just... I may as well have been doing it to myself, you know. And so, uh, I don't know, that, that's lame. You know, that's, that's kind of lame. And, so, and even when you get kids in a Zoom, sometimes, I mean, every class is different. Every class is different. Some classes are just kids are either more tired or they're quieter just by their nature or whatever. Hello there, Evelyn. Hello there, Devin. Thanks so much for joining in this morning. But yeah, I mean, you just don't quite have the level of um, personability, I guess would be how I would describe it. Uh, Vanya, good morning to you. Um, yeah, so it, you know, but it's, it's been fine, you know. Um, I'll tell you what, I would not have, here's the one thing that has been the advantage is because I had a, I, and I continue to have this, this semester, I've had a, just a very serious workload. And I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure that I would have been able to do it unless we were remote because I'm essentially working almost two full-time jobs, you know. Um, I put in a tremendous hour. I work six days a week. I put in a tremendous amount of hours doing grading and doing lecturing and doing planning and dealing with issues with students and so on and so forth. So, um you know, I'm not even sure that I would have been able to do it unless unless we were in a remote scenario. So I guess that that is, a, a, you know, a good side of the distance learning. But anyway, well, I guess we should get started here. So let's pop this over to here, and then I'm going to bring this up, and I'm going to scroll back up to where we left off, which was talking about serfdom. Okay, so um, serfdom in... Uh, Eastern Europe began to be consolidated between uh, 1500 and 1650. Teddy, what's up, man? Quick question about Louis the Fourteenth. Go for it. was it called when Louis the 14th forced nobles to watch him dress yeah levy
And to be honest, that wasn't the only time either. You know, the other thing about that is all of these court proceedings, um, you know, the, the, the noble courts, they're kind of silly. You know, they, they took them so seriously. There were all of these procedures to everything from getting the king dressed to feeding the king to dancing in court and all of these court festivities. There was all this, like, proper, orderly, uh, you know, procedure to everything. And it was very routine. It was very, very, very routine. And, you know, and the thing that's so funny about it is you look at it today and you would probably, as a, like, if you were a fly on the wall in the room observing these court procedures, you'd be like, this is so ridiculous. Um, because it's just over the top. It's just so peculiar these systems that um, were associated with the highest ranking parts of society. And that's one of the reasons which we'll talk about later, the enlightenment takes off is because as times progress and people are kind of observing how the courts operate. And when I say the courts, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the courts like we have in the United States courts. That's not the kind of, I'm talking about like King's court, okay? All of the things that happen at Versailles and Peterhof Palace and the Escorial Palace in Spain, all of these things are so silly. They're just ridiculous. And people start to look at it like, who are these people? They're so out of touch with how most people live. Um, and so there begins to become questioning of, you know, of authority about, you know, not only the court and who is in the court with all these nobles, but the kinds of things that they spend their time doing with all these stupid procedures and dances and festivities and procedures for getting dressed, procedures for being fed, procedures for anything. I mean, there was all sorts of different things like that. It was just really dumb. When you look on it today, it just looks peculiar. Anyhow, okay, let's talk about it. Serfdom. Consolidated between 1500 and 1650, hereditary serfdom was reestablished in Poland, Russia, and Prussia by the mid-17th century. So this period saw the growth of estate agriculture, especially in Poland and Eastern Germany. Why was Eastern Europe more inclined to invoking serfdom but not Western Europe? Well, part of the reasons were economic, but not all of them. All right, not all of the reasons were economic. Um, you did have, uh, in Eastern Europe, you had more supremacy of noble landlords, meaning that nobles in Eastern Europe, comparative to nobles in Western Europe's relationship to the king, um, Eastern European nobles tended to have more supremacy. Uh, most kings, in fact, were essentially considered amongst East Eastern nobles first among equals. In other words, they didn't look to the king as being a person who was on um, a, a level higher than them in society. They saw the king as first among all other equal nobles. So Eastern lords had more political power than in the West. And those monarchs in Eastern Europe really needed those nobles because the kingdoms being less centralized at that time, they needed the nobles to operate as kind of um, you know, enforcers of their policies. And so rather than, rather than try and subdue the nobles' powers uh, in Eastern Europe, there are some examples of where that happens, but in general, Eastern European nobles tend to retain more power than Western nobles do in relation to the king. And that's in part because kings in Eastern Europe or the Tsars of Eastern Europe were very reliant on having a loyal noble class uh, that served the king. So um, constant warfare in Eastern Europe also was a region that, uh, reason that serfdom proliferated there and political chaos resulted in noble landlord class increasing their political power at the expense of the monarchs in some situations. Also in Eastern Europe, weak Eastern kings had little power to control landlord policies that were aimed at peasants. And so one of the reasons that the power of nobles increases over serfs at this time is because um, local landlords were able to 
ad- administer the law in a way where, uh, you know, they were able to administer the law in a way where it subdued or subjugated the peasants living on their land because the peasants in Eastern Europe were weaker politically than in the West. Also, landlords undermined the medieval privileges of towns and power of urban classes uh, in Eastern Europe. Now, there are also, to note, fewer urban areas, cities or towns in Eastern Europe, and they are more uh, sporadically uh, you know, dispersed across the uh, terrain. But anyhow, talking about some of the rising empires. So we've already looked at the declining empires during the age of absolutism. We're now going to be looking at some of the, uh, the rising empires, starting with the Austrian Empire, the Habsburg Austrians, the rise of Austrian. Basically, you know, going back in history to the Roman, uh, Holy Roman Empire, the ruler of Austria was traditionally selected as Holy Roman Emperor, and Habsburgs no longer ruled Spain after 1713. Um, The Habsburg Empire included Sardinia, Milan, and Naples, as well as the Austrian Netherlands, which previously belonged to the Spanish Netherlands, which were at the time also uh, Habsburg in terms of the dynasty of Spain. Uh, Remember that after 1713, the reason the Habsburgs no longer ruled Spain was because, um, you know, the last Habsburg monarch of Spain was Carlos II, Uh, who, uh, on his deathbed in his will, he left uh, the kingdom of Spain to uh, Philip, Duke of Anjou, the grandson of uh, French King Louis XIV. And so that initiated that war of Austrian succession, uh, the last war of Louis XIV. And after that war, the Spanish Netherlands, modern-day Belgium, got transferred over into the hands of the Austrian Habsburgs. Um, and were retained by Austria. Also, as far east as Hungary and even what is now modern-day Romania at the time known as Transylvania. And so here you can see the main domain of the Austrian Empire, but it also had several possessions across the Holy Roman Empire and then as well over into, uh, you know, what became... So this was before the Spanish were defeated. This is in 1700, so that's prior to the War of Spanish Succession. After the War of Spanish Succession, these territories here of the Spanish Netherlands get absorbed into the Austrian Netherlands, and they retain control over, as I said, far eastern regions like Hungary and Romania as well. And here's just another map of the growth of the Habsburgs. Here's the Austrian Netherlands once again over here. You can see see that they control regions in much of Italy as well as all the way over here into Eastern Europe and down into the Balkans like Croatia and Serbia. All right, so uh, the government organization of that Austrian Habsburgs, remember that the Austrian Empire, because they control all of these lands, it is not a national state in the same way that England is, right? England is all made up of English people, um, whereas Austria is made up of a multinational empire. It's, it's the fact that Austria is a small territory that goes and conquers a, other regions and subdues them or intermarries with other kings and absorbs them, annexes them, etc. So you have Austria proper, which contains both Germans and Italians. You also had a region known as Bohemia controlled by the Habsburgs, which was mostly Czechs and Germans. And then you had Hungary, which is, of course, going to be the Hungarians, the Magyars, as well as other uh, Slavic-type folks, such as the Serbs, the Croats, and then uh, the Romanians as well. And in the Habs- Austrian Habsburg system, there is no constitutional um, system. There's no single constitutional system. Each of the uh, regions of these areas is kind of administered slightly differently. Uh, important Habsburg's ruler, Habsburg rulers include Ferdinand II, who gained Bohemia for Austria during the Thirty Years' War, the last religious war of Europe. He was also the one that was uh, king during the defenestration of Prague. And then you had Ferdinand III, uh, who was the king of the uh, Habsburg dynasty of Austria from 1637 to 1657. And it was during Ferdinand III's time that the Austrian Empire began centralizing the government in the old hereditary provinces of Austria. And then another famous one was Leopold I, who severely restricted Protestantism in a post-30 years war era. 
He also successfully repelled the Turks in the siege of Vienna from the gates of Vienna in 1683, and that was the last time that the Ottoman Turks were going to attempt to take Central Europe and take over Austria. So Leopold I, don't get Leopold I of Austria, by the way, confused with King Leopold of Belgium of the late 1800s, who we will talk about in second semester. Leopold I successfully repelled the Turks. Leopold of Belgium was the one who ended up subduing the Congo and um, essentially conducting a massacre of the Congolese people in, in uh, South Central Africa. Probably one of the best known Habsburgs ruler of this Habsburg rulers of this time was Emperor Charles VI, Holy Roman Emperor from 1711 to 1740, whereupon his death, um, he uh, initiates inadvertently a, another war of succession in Europe. Now remember that there's a difference between succession and secession. When you secede, you are breaking away. That is not what we are talking about here. The Civil War is where part of America secedes from the Union, and this initiates a civil war. When we talk about the wars of succession, okay, wars of succession are pertaining to who is going to take over the state after the king dies. And so the War of Spanish Succession is about who's going to take over Spain after Carlos II dies, the War of Austrian Succession, which happens when Charles VI dies of the Austrian Habsburgs, is initiated due to something known as pragmatic sanction. And that's because Charles VI didn't have any sons. And because he didn't have any sons, this went against an old school practice uh, practiced in Eastern Europe known as uh, the Salic Law, and this was practiced during medieval times. It's an old medieval practice that basically says that whereupon a king's death results in a change of rulers, that the new ruler has to be a son or male relative of the king. Okay, and so um, Emperor Charles the Sixth had a daughter, and he didn't want his. Uh, you know, his empire to be split up when he died. He wanted the entire kingdom of Austria, the entire Austrian Habsburg uh, uh, holdings to transfer to his daughter. But, it, you know, going to a daughter, transferring titles and stuff like that down to a daughter went against Salic law. And so when he dies, Prussia actually takes advantage of this scenario and initiates a war against Austria called the War of Austrian Succession. Not because they really had any problems with Maria Theresa, but more because it was a window of opportunity for Prussia to use their military to exert dominance and take over some territories known as Silesia. So the law of pragmatic sanction would basically said that when uh, Charles VI dies, that his lands were never to be divided and that they were going to be passed intact to a single heir. And the heir in this case was going to be his daughter, Maria Theresa, who inherited Charles's empire in 1740 and ultimately ended up ruling Austria for 40 years. Now, moving on to Prussia. The dynasty that runs Prussia, which is also known as Brandenburg Prussia for a while, uh, was the Hohenzollern dynasty. And the background on that is that the ruler of Brandenburg uh, had become one of the seven electors in the Holy Roman Empire in 1417, going all the way back to pre-Renaissance times. But by the 17th century, Brandenburg had really not significantly been involved in Holy Roman Empire affairs. And the marriages that they had conducted increasingly gave the Hohenzollerns control of German principalities in Central and Western Germany. So the Hohenzollern dynasty was a dynasty that was very clever with how they went about increasing their power by way of marriage, by way of um, alliances and things like that, marriage alliances and so on, so that the heirs uh, would be married off and be able to make claims on territories or inherit territories. So, um, you know, the prince of the Hohenzollern dynasty had relatively little power over the nobility at this time because, once again, he's relying on the nobles to increase the prestige of the state of Brandenburg. 
The real change for the state of Brandenburg comes with this guy, Frederick William, the Great Elector, King of Brandenburg from 1640 to 1688. So that's going all the way back to still while the uh, Thirty Years' War is going on. And he was a strict Calvinist, but he granted tolerations to Catholics and Jews in a time when it wasn't very popular. And he also admired the Swedish system of government and the Dutch economic power that was developing to the west of Brandenburg in uh, Western Europe. Uh, he was also threatened by the Swedish-Polish struggle that was going on in the Baltic. And remember that the Baltic is in the north, the Balkans are in the south, and Brandenburg is in northern Germany. So we're talking about the Baltic Sea regions up where Sweden and Poland are. And, um, and these wars were wars that were conducted by Louis XIV. So under uh, Frederick William, the great elector, Brandenburg is kind of in a constant state of crisis, but he uses that ability or that crisis um, to his advantage because he um, ends up establishing Prussia as a great power and laid foundations for the future unification of Germany. So Frederick William, the great elector, the most significant uh, contribution is that he oversaw Prussian militarism and created the most efficient army in Europe at that time. He also unified his Rhine holdings, Prussia and Brandenburg, into a strong single state. He also uh, enacted heavy taxation for the sake of military spending. In fact, he spent twice as much on the Prussian military than Louis XIV did on the French military. And you can see here's the regions of Brandenburg, which had increasingly made connections through marriage in western regions of Germany here. Okay, And then they also take over regions in Pomerania in this northern uh, coastal region of Germany here. And then the Duchy of Prussia over here is allied with Brandenburg, and so it becomes actually Brandenburg hyphen Prussia, so it becomes kind of a hyphenated kingdom until the kingdom of Brandenburg is dissolved in favor of the title of the kingdom of Prussia. And you can see that in the war of uh, Austrian succession, they gain Silesia here, and of course, uh, later on, under the rule of Frederick the Great of Prussia, uh, Frederick II, Frederick the Great of Prussia, um, initiates the, uh, the uh, partitions of Poland where uh, these regions of Poland get absorbed by the Prussian state. So Prussia is you know, quite cleverly growing in size and military strength at this time. And um, the military was primarily run by a group of nobles known as Junkers. So whenever we talk about the noble class of Prussia, we're talking about Junkers, and they formed the backbone of the Prussian military officer corps. Uh, remember that the officers are the people making the big decisions in the military, they're higher ranking, um, and they will always, even an officer on his first day on the job will immediately outrank an enlisted rank that's been serving for 30 years because officers are typically, especially in these times, um, you know, better educated, and in this time, they come from the noble class. And so these nobles and landowners dominated the estates of Brandenburg and Prussia. And in 1653, hereditary subjugation of serfs was established as a way of compensating the nobles for their support of the crown. So one of the reasons, one of the ways in which the nobles are able to um, stay in good graces with the king is that the king basically says you can do whatever you want with your people lower than you on your lands on the social hierarchy uh, and I will continue to grant you powerful positions within the Prussian military um, but uh, you may not um, you may not though uh, uh, challenge my authority. Okay, so basically the idea being that the Junkers were these l young landowning lords who were given high ranks in the Prussian military, which also gave them authority, but their main authority was not to check the king or challenge the king. Their main authority was going to be over people lower than them, like serfs who lived on their lands uh, on the social hierarchy. Also, he encouraged industry and trade um, uh, Prussia began importing skilled craftsmen and Dutch farmers at this time. New industries began emerging in 
uh, Prussia, like wool, cotton, linens, velvet, lace, silk, soap, paper, and iron products. Uh, and remember that all of these at this time were done using essentially hand labor or old school, um, you know, mercantile uh, style of, uh, of industry. It's not really like, it's not like factories and stuff like that, okay, just to let you know. Um, their efforts at overseas, tr overseas trade largely failed, though, due to Prussia's lack of ports and naval experience. And under Frederick I, sometimes called Frederick the Ostentatious, he is really the first to be known as the first king of Prussia, if you will. And he ends up being, at the time, the most popular Hohenzollern ruler in Europe at the time. And he in very much sought to imitate the court of Louis XIV. He also encouraged Prussians to gain a higher education, especially the Junker class. He fought two wars against Louis XIV, despite that he was trying to mimic or model his own state after the state practices of Louis XIV's absolutist state of France. Um, so the two wars that Louis XIV fought against Frederick I of Prussia were the War of the League of Augsburg and the War of Spanish Succession. Um, in both of these wars, uh, Frederick I, the ostentatious, allied with the Austrian Habsburgs, the dynasty that just to the south of the Prussians. And after the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713, that ended the War of Spanish Succession, the elector of Brandenburg, Prussia, was now recognized internationally as the King of Prussia in return for their aid to the Habsburgs during those two wars against France. Uh, one of the most famous kings of Prussia is Frederick William I, uh, King of Prussia, also known as the Soldatenkönig, or the Soldier's King, and he reigned from the last year of the War of Spanish Succession and the, and the year of death of Louis XIV, uh, 1713, all the way up to 1740, which was the year of death of Charles VI, the Habsburg ruler who issued pragmatic sanction uh, and uh, was replaced by his daughter, Maria Theresa, just to the south. And so, um, you know, he dies the same year uh, that, that uh, Charles VI dies. And so both Prussia and Austria in 1740 see the um, respective rulers of their dynasties, uh, you know, die and, and, and be succeeded by uh, the next in line. And in um, Prussia, the next in line is going to be uh, Frederick William I's son, uh, known as Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great. And so Frederick William I, to talk a little bit about the soldier king, Frederick William I, the soldier king, he established Prussian absolutism and infused militarism into the society. During Frederick William I's reign, they sometimes nickname Prussia the Sparta of the North, which is a reference to ancient Greek city-states uh, like Sparta and Athens. Sparta of the ancient Greek city-states was a militaristic society that had um, essentially, it was a brutally authoritarian type society where the entire society was regimented essentially like a military. And although Sparta was relatively small in population, um, they more than made up for it with their might. And so very small in size, but very large in might. And that is very um, also accurate uh, to describe the Prussian military of this time. Um, even though it's Europe's fourth largest army be behind France, Russia, and Austria, they actually are the best and most efficient army in Europe, and that's due to them incorporating things like marching and drill instruction and other things like that. And also, by funding the military, 80% of state revenue from Prussia under Frederick William I went to the military. And they did this on purpose because they pretty much felt like, you know, the Prussia, if you look at where Prussia is on a map, it's essentially surrounded by several other European powers in Austria, Russia, and France. And so, um, you know, the, the, that made it necessary for them to um, spend a lot on their military to kind of show to other European powers, like, look, if you come and mess with us, we're going to mess you up. And so their army was really designed to deter war because they didn't want to be engaging in battles where they had to constantly be defending themselves against other rival powers in Europe. They also developed under Frederick William I, the Soldatenkönig, one of the most efficient bureaucracies in Europe. 
Junkers remained in the officer's castle in the army in return for support of the king's absolutism. They also began establishing compulsory education for children, even for peasant children, because, um, you know, Frederick William I established about a thousand schools for peasant kids. And remember, those Junkers were those young landowning lords. Their influence over the land and Prussian army was what really gave them their power, but the king was able to, you know, balance that power out by increasing the power that they had over the people beneath them on the social hierarchy. And then we get to Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great, who reigned from 1740 to 1786. Now, um, the thing about Frederick the Great is that he also is one of three kings in Europe, uh, or rulers of Europe, rather, that get the special title of being what's known as an enlightened despot. Now, we haven't yet gotten to the Enlightenment, so I will not talk much about Frederick II today. But I will let you know that Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great, is accompanied by Catherine the Great, who you watched in that documentary for today. Um, Catherine the Great was the uh, enlightened despot of Russia, who existed at the same time as Frederick II did. Also, Catherine the Great was also Catherine II. Okay, and then there was another second, which was Joseph II of Austria. However, unlike Frederick and Catholic, <laughs> Frederick and Catholic, unlike Frederick and Catherine, who both have the title the Great at the end of their names, unfortunately Joseph II does not get called Joseph the Great because um, many of his policies ultimately failed in Austria after he died. And like I said, we'll talk more about these enlightened despots next unit when we start talking about the Enlightenment. So I'm going to kind of sit on them for now, but just letting you know that Frederick II, who comes after Frederick William I, the Soldatenkönig, um, is going to be another major figure of Prussia. Moving on to the last, uh, but certainly not least, uh, territory that we need to talk about today, and that is Russia. Giving you just a little bit of historical background on Russia, they had the Greek Orthodox Church. So the Russians practiced Eastern Orthodox Christianity, uh, which had developed after a split in the Catholic Church going back to about the 800s. Um, there was a schism in the 800s that essentially established uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church, which was practiced mostly in the Byzantine Empire and places like Greece and uh, Turkey and places like that and uh, Russia as well. And so the Greek Orthodox Church assimilated the descendants of the Vikings uh, with the Slavs. And so basically, uh, for a while in Russia, there was no Russia because the Mongols, the golden horde of the Mongols, uh, led by Genghis Khan, uh, basically completely took Russia over for about two, two centuries or so. Eventually, though, as the Mongols began to wane in their um, ability to maintain control, uh, princes of Moscow, who had served the Khan, which was the ruler of the Mongols, began to consolidate their own rule and replaced Mongol power. And uh, the two most important kings of, of what became known as this early Russian form, uh, or Russian state form called Muscovy, Muscovy was ruled by Ivan I and Ivan III, uh, as being the two most important rulers of that time. So Muscovy began to emerge as the most significant principality uh, of the region of what later became Russia. And of course now uh, we have, it's no longer called Muscov Muscovy. You have to say it with Russian accent. It does not sound right unless you say Muscovy, right? It is now Moscow. Uh, so anyhow, you've got, uh, you've got Muscovy, and then uh, that becomes Moscow, and then eventually, of course, it consolidates into the entire Russian Empire. But the Russian nobles were known at this time as boyars, boyars, and um, kind of the same as how uh, you know the, the Prussian nobles were known as Junkers. They're going to be German. The Russian nobles were known as boyars, and the free peasantry made it difficult for these Muscovite rulers to strengthen the state because you had these free peasants and that's one of the reasons that serfdom ends up being used in Russia, is to subdue the free peasantry and make it easier for the boyars to rule. 
So Ivan III, also known as Ivan the Great, was the one who ended in 1480 Mongol domination of Muscovy. Muscovy. He declared himself hereditary ruler, and in response to the fall of the Byzantine Empire and his desire to make Moscow the new center of the church, he created what became known as the Third Rome, otherwise known as um, the Tsar of Russia, okay? The Tsar was originally the head of the church, okay? But basically, he declares himself a hereditary ruler, a Tsar, which is sometimes spelled T-S-A-R or C-Z-A-R. Both of them mean the same thing, and both of them are derived from the old Roman Empire title of Caesar, so when we think Tsar, think Caesar, almost like Julius Caesar or Caesar Augustus. So that title of Tsar is a etymology, a etymologically goes back to, uh, uh, to the term Caesar, and it is going to mean head of church and state. And so the, uh, he, they also, under uh, Ivan III, began importing Greek scholars, craftsmen, architects, and artists to develop the art and architecture of Russia. Also, Ivan the Third, Ivan the Great, declared absolutism that was uh, that absolutism was derived from divine right, which, as you'll note, actually was not written about by the French until Jacques Bossuet, who we read a piece from earlier on in this unit talking about divine right as its connection to absolutism. But Ivan the Third in Russia had already been declaring absolutism. Uh, being derived from divine right. In other words, God giving the king the power to rule. Ivan III struggled with boyars for power because remember that in Russia, uh, just like with many cases of Eastern absolutism, uh, the nobles were relatively much more powerful in, in those regions than in, in Western Europe. And so in Eastern Europe, uh, Ivan struggles with the boyars for power, but eventually the power of the boyars was reduced uh, but they do gain, once again, in return for that, greater control over their peasants. So although their power against the king is reduced, their power over their subjects is increased. All right, uh, the uh, next major notable figure of the early days of Russia is a guy known as Ivan IV, a.k.a. Ivan the Terrible. And he rules from 1533 to 1584. Now, the background on Ivan the Terrible, he was the grandson of Ivan the Great, okay? And he was the first to officially take the title of Tsar. And he is also um, significant because he's the one that eventually helps to establish the beginning of what becomes known as the Romanov dynasty. Not by design necessarily, he didn't do it deliberately, but that is, and that it, he's significant because he marries somebody from the Romanov family. They have children, but also um, they have uh, distant relatives. And um, those relatives, uh, like nieces and nephews and stuff like that, ultimately end up playing a major role for the future of Russia. So uh, under Ivan IV, you've got territorial expansion of Russia during this time. Russia is expanding territorially. They're growing in size. They control the Black Sea region at that time. They won huge eastern territories going over into Asia. And then they also gained territories in the Baltic, which is what's demonstrated on this map here. You can see that in these regions of what is now modern day, like for example, well, much, much of this is like modern day Russia today, but down in these regions here, they're pushing into these Baltic states, okay? What ends up down the line becoming modern day Latvia, Estonia, Lith Lithuania, down in these regions here, they're starting to push towards those regions there. They don't claim them quite yet, but they do gain these regions here, and they also push up against Swedish territory up here, or Finnish territory, and then Swedish territory over here. All right, and then also under Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, St. Basil's Cathedral was uh, constructed. Ivan IV was the one who ordered the construction of the church to commemorate Muscovy's victory over the Kazan and Astrakhan, and, um, you know, the Mongols, that is. And the structure was completed in uh, around 1555 to 1561. And of course, this architecture incorporates Eastern Byzantine design into it uh, that you don't see in Western European architecture. So the architecture of Russia is going to take on a different form 
due to the influence of Eastern Orthodox Christianity as well as the influence of the Byzantine Empire and um, Eastern uh, Muslim architecture as well. And so they began the process of westernization. Uh, they encouraged trade with England and the Netherlands. And under uh, Peter, or excuse me, under um, Ivan the Terrible, they waged a very costly war with Poland, Lithuania, uh, where Cossacks from that region, uh, which were peasants who fled east and formed, formed bands of outlaws, posed a particular threat to the stability of uh, early day Russia, early days Russia. Um, Ru uh, also under Ivan the Great, or Ivan the Terrible rather, he reduced the powers of the boyars. Um, all nobles under Ivan the Terrible had to serve the Tsar in order to keep their lands, and so he is essentially um, forcing the, the boyars to serve the king if they want to keep their lands. It's rather totalitarian in nature, dictatorial. And merchants and artisans were bound to their towns and not allowed to leave. So merchants and artisans would remain in their towns that they lived in and uh, continue producing things for, their, for those towns. Now, when Ivan the Terrible dies, Russia goes into about a 30-year period of turmoil known as the Time of Troubles after his death. And this lasts all the way up until 1613. And this is a period of time where you've got a bunch of crop failures in Russia resulting in famines, food shortages. Um, there's also power struggles between various noble leaders in the vacuum of power that was left after Ivan the Terrible died, as well as war and conflicts with neighboring territories and nations. And so um, during this time, Cossack bands, those kind of higher ranking peasants from what is now modern day like Ukraine and places like that, uh, start traveling northward, killing nobles and officials. So the Cossacks, the peasants, uh, are kind of in revolt, causing problems. Uh, Sweden and Poland get con uh, end up conquering Moscow during these times. And nobles elected to try to you know, cope with all of these crazy things that are going on during the time of troubles. Nobles elected Ivan's grandnephew as the new hereditary Tsar. And this established what became known as the Romanov dynasty, the Romanov dynasty or Romanov dynasty. And so the Romanov dynasty or Romanov dynasty lasted from 1613 to 1917. That is not a misprint. That's right. It lasts for three full centuries all the way up until just three, 103 years ago. Okay, so we don't see the fall of the Romanov Russian dynasty until 1917. That's a that's relatively short period of time, uh, you know, in terms of the grand scheme of things, and they end at the uh, about three quarters of the way through World War One. Uh, they lasted from the ascent of Michael Romanov, who was the nephew of Ivan the Terrible, all the way up to the last Tsar of the Romanov dynasty, known as Nicholas the Second, the last Tsar of Russia. So Michael Romanov or Michael Romanov. Uh, who lived from 1613, or reigned rather, from 1613 to 1645. How did he rule? Well, he favored nobles in return for their support. He does expand the Russian Empire eastward all the way over to the Pacific Ocean. And um, there were a number of changes in Michael Romanov's dynasty uh, at this time to Russian society. And, for example, nobles gained military exemptions, meaning that nobles in good graces of the king didn't have to serve in the military if they didn't want to. The rights of peasants declined significantly as more serfs start to be created as uh, tied to the land during his time. Uh, old believers who resisted the new religious sects from the West like Lutheranism and Calvinism, severely were persecuted by the government because old believers um, were anti-Romanov. Um, anti they were anti-new um, uh, power structures, uh, state power structures forming in Russia. And so old believers, these people who believed that Russia should be more faith-oriented rather than state uh, apparatus-oriented, were persecuted by the government as trying to undermine the government's ability to control the affairs of Russia. 
Also under Michael Romanov, they continue their process of westernizing and trying to be more like Western Europe. And by 1689, Russia was uh, the world's largest country. It was, in fact, the entire territories of Russia comprised about three times the size of the entire continent of Europe. Peter the Great is the best known Russian ruler, and he reigns from 1682, uh, kind of during uh, you know Louis the Fourteenth's reign, all the way up through Louis the Fourteenth's death, uh, past about ten years his death or so, up to the year 1725. So he rules Russia for a good long time, about forty some years, and um, and a little bit of background on Peter the Great. Um, his sister, uh, his older sister, was named Sophia, and she ruled as his regent early on when he was too young to rule on his own. But she had this plot to kill him, which failed. Uh, and Peter had her banished for in her entire life to a monastery. Rather than executing his own sister, he, um, he made her essentially a nun, banished her to isolation in a tower, in a monastery where he then strung up the bodies of the uh, co-conspirators of his sister Sophia outside the windows of the monastery where she would have to look at them when she looked outside. And uh, so he's pretty brutal. The other thing to know about Peter the Great, even though so far what I've described is extraordinarily brutal, um, the thing about Peter the Great is he is gargantuan for his size. Now, kids, I know that most of you have not really met me in person, or if you've seen me on campus last year, you may not really know who I am. But if you've ever seen a dude who's six foot six walking around campus, super tall guy, that was probably me. I'm a very tall guy. And Peter the Great dwarves me at six feet nine inches tall. The guy weighed nearly 300 pounds. He was so strong he could bend horseshoes with his hands, okay? Um, just an enormous individual. And to be honest with you, people just did not grow that large back in those days. It was exceedingly rare for people to hit even just six feet. And this dude is nearly seven feet tall. So he is truly a memorable type figure, uh, and he definitely had uh, just as big of a personality to go along with his very, very large size in terms of his physical stature. One of the early revolts during Peter the, uh, the Great's reign was the Streltsy Revolt, which was put down by Peter the Great. This is where various uh, Moscow guards um, began to challenge Peter the Great's rule and had overthrown previous leaders. And remember that Peter the Great is kind of an absentee king for a while or an absentee czar because he, um, he ends up uh, going on a long uh, voyage uh, over to the Netherlands, to England, to France, and kind of scoping out what Western Europe has to offer, learning new things about ships, learning new things about uh, court policy and other things like that. And, um, and during that time, the Streltsy start to challenge Peter the Great's rule. And when he hears about that, he comes back to Moscow and he subdues the Streltsy revolt. And they talk about that in that documentary that you watch for today. And in case you didn't see the painting that was done, Peter the Great Streltsy Revolt. Let's do that. And why is this not working? Internet access Streltsy Rebellion. Uh, hmm. Well, apparently my internet isn't loading this. Let's try on, uh, what's that other one called, Edge? There we go. Streltsy Uprising. Okay, so this is the painting that they showed you in that... Um, in that documentary, and if you zoom in over here to the look that Peter the Great has on his face, he's just giving these guys the 
the death stare, okay? And you can see the Streltsy revolt uh, over here and the impact of the Moscow Guards' attempted rebellion against Peter the Great. And boy, oh boy, was that, uh, that was something to behold, wasn't it? So, um, Peter the Great, whoops, defeats the Streltsy rebellion. And um, the security of Peter's reign was now intact after the Streltsy Revolt, who had in, in previous years posed a challenge to other previous leaders as well. And after the uh, decimation of the Streltsy Revolt, Peter's major concern turns to turning Russia into a military European power. And uh, each Russian village was required to send recruits to the army who then served 25-year enlistments, which meant that they were essentially serving for the majority of their lives. Because in the American military, by comparison, if you were to enlist in the American military, you're going to serve for four-year terms. And then if you get done with your first four-year term, you can re-sign for another four-year term. Um, but for 25 years, that basically means the majority of your adult life is going to be spent serving the military. 75% of the national budget at the time was spent on the military, meaning that there was a whole lot of revenue spent on developing a royal army of over 200,000 men plus an additional 100,000 special forces of Cossacks and foreigners who they um, conscripted into service as well. And they established royal military and artillery academies to train military officers and um, soldiers into the uh, Russian military. All young male nobles were at this time required to leave home and serve five years of compulsory education at this time, which meant that you had a noble class that was becoming better educated under Peter the Great. They also developed a very large navy built on the Baltic Sea. Even though the Russian navy declined after Peter's death, they nonetheless developed a navy under him for the first time ever. And non-nobles had opportunities to rise up on the ranks, depending if they had um, served admirably or had demonstrated themselves as um, having merit in command ability. Um, they also fought under Peter the Great in the Great Northern War, which is the most significant conflict that Russia took place in in Europe during the... Um, reign of Peter the Great. And this lasted for 20 years, from 1700 to 21. It, it, was, a, it was a war between Russia, along with uh, Poland, Denmark, and, and uh, northern Germany, Saxony, as their allies, versus Sweden, who was ruled at the time by Charles XII of Sweden. And this Great Northern War culminated in the Battle of Poltava. The Battle of Poltava was the most decisive naval battle where Russia ended up defeating Sweden, and uh, both on the sea and on the land. And the Treaty of Nystad was signed in 1721, which is where Russia finally gained those territories of Latvia and Estonia, and thus gained its, quote, window to the west in the Baltic Sea. And this is those territories that, like I was talking about earlier, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, down into these regions here. Uh, they end up uh, taking over these regions and being able now to ship from these inlets uh, of the Baltic Sea over to uh, places like Denmark, northern Germany, um, you know, the Dutch Republic, even England over in the North Sea in England. Uh, also under Peter the Great, he was best known for his process of modernizing and westernizing Russia um, these were some of his major focuses. He brought back from his travels in his early in his reign, he brought back with him a, a bunch of ideas um, to, of technology and culture to Russia for Russia to begin mimicking what Western places like France were doing. Uh, so he imported many Western technicians and craftsmen to aid in the building of large factories. When I say factories, again, I'm not talking about like industrial revolution factories. I'm talking more about like handmade good factories, things like that. And by 1725, Russia was actually outproducing England in iron, although not outproducing either Sweden or Germany. But nonetheless, industrial serfdom existed in factories where workers could be actually bought and sold, very similar to slaves. Uh, to work in these, um, you know, these, these industries that are starting to develop. 
After he returned from Western Europe, Peter had decreed, in other words, declared, forced upon uh, people by way of formal declaration, that the boyars would cease wearing the long traditional uh, robes and start cutting their beards. And this was one of several efforts by Peter the Great to begin westernizing Russian society to make Russia look more like Western Europe as opposed to look more like um, some of the uh, fashions that had descended from the Mongols of having long beards and kind of traditionally oriental style clothing. Um, so uh, government became more efficient under, uh, under Peter the Great. The Tsar ruled by decree, which was once again an abs uh, example of absolutism. Um, under Peter the Great, they established something known as the Table of Ranks. And what this did was it set educational standards for civil servants, uh, most of whom were nobles. And Peter sought to replace old boyar nobility with new service-based nobility loyal to the Tsar. And this is very similar to the practice in Western Europe by Louis XIV of um, raising people to noble of the robe status if they could afford to pay for it. So you get these new nobles in there who are loyal to the king because the king is the one that granted them their noble title. And they try to subdue the old nobles of the sword. And that's exactly what Peter starts to do, taking a, play, a page out of the playbook of uh, Louis XIV. They also enforced um, during this time under uh, Louis the, or excuse me, under um, Peter the Great, is that uh, they started using the Russian secret police very ruthlessly and efficiently to crush any potential opponents of Peter's rule or state bureaucracy. Um, taxation became much more uh, uniform in Russia at this time. There was a lot of heavy trade uh, sales and um, heavy, excuse me, heavy taxation on trade and sales and rent. And um, uh, there was a head tax on every male. And so basically you had to pay taxes, uh, you know, for, for every head of person that lived on your land. And then um, the state control of the Russian Orthodox Church was another feature of Peter the Great's rule, where he was able to subdue uh, church authority uh, to state superior status. Um, and uh, St. Petersburg gets founded as the port city where Peter the Great develops his navy. It was one of Peter's crowning achievements was establishing St. Petersburg, which ultimately ended up becoming the capital of Russia for a very long time where the Tsar resided or the Tsarina at various points in time resided in Russia. And it was Peter the Great who sought to create a city very similar to Amsterdam as well as a palace similar to Versailles. So he wanted to take some of these ideas that he had um, acquired on his travels when he went to the Dutch Republic and he went to visit Versailles and he went to visit um, England and so on. He wanted to bring some of these ideas back of having a navy, having a port city, having a magnificent palace for Russia to make Russia um, a competitor uh, that would be recognized by other European states as legitimate. And by his death, the city was the largest city in Northern Europe with around 75,000 inhabitants, which was mostly because people were forced to live there. Um, he wouldn't let them leave. But anyway, um, St. Petersburg became the capital. It's very cosmopolitan in nature. Construction of St. Petersburg began in as early as 1703. Labor was conscripted. In other words, they basically just took serfs and forced them to work on the city. Peter ordered many noble families to move to the city. That's also something very similar to what uh, Louis XIV did during his reign when he would force families to live at Versailles for several months of the year. He forced noble families to move to St. Petersburg and live in various palaces in St. Petersburg, many of which are still there today. And also he ordered merchants and artisans to live in the city and to help build it. And like I said, he conscripted peasants very, very uh, heavily into labor in the city's construction, resulting in a death toll of perhaps up to about 100,000 Russian peasants who built the city of St. Petersburg as well as the surrounding regions. The Great Palace of St. Uh, Petersburg is known as the Peterhof Palace. It was built in the image of Versailles. And indeed, uh, Peterhof Palace often is nicknamed by Russians the Versailles of the East because it is so similar in terms of its design and because of its function, which was to, um, you know, basically uh, 
aggrandize, if you will, the the Tsar of Russia. It was to it was for the purposes of absolutism. It was to make the king look great. And of course, when you're living in a beautiful palace like Peterhof, it makes you look quite great. So here is what it looks like. The backyard looks very similar to Versailles once again with the giant gardens in the back. You have gilded statues and sculptures all over the place. Inside, the walls are decorated with all sorts of fancy designs. And then the ceilings, of course, have a bunch of these opulent paintings on the ceiling with a bunch of gilded, uh, you know, uh, gilded, uh, what you call it, you know, um, paint on um, on all of the you know borders of the of the painting and stuff like that these frescoes on the ceiling so all of these and it's basically also um, you can't see it in this image too well but it's basically right on the port you can see the water in the background here okay so it's right on the coast uh, Peterhof Palace was was right along the coast whereas um, whereas Versailles was uh, was uh, more further inland it wasn't it wasn't along the coast anywhere um, and so that's kind of what Versailles looks like. Also, um, under uh, Peter the Great's daughter, who, who took over the, the position of Tsarina after uh, Peter the Great died, was Catherine I. Now, Catherine I is not Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great is Catherine II. She's actually German, of all things, but she's nonetheless still gets the title of Tsarina because she marries um, Peter III, if I remember right. But anyhow... Queen Catherine I was the one who received, um, uh, or, or who funded, rather, a major overhaul to the Winter Palace. And the Winter Palace um, is in St. Petersburg. And then um, you can see here Catherine Palace, as it's sometimes called, um, in St. Petersburg. And, um, and Catherine Palace, or, or the Winter Palace, will play a prominent role in the story of the Russian Revolution happening in 1917 when we get to its second semester. At the end of the day, though, finishing up on Peter the Great, Peter's reforms basically modernized Russia. They brought it closer to the mainstream of Europe. Uh, they made it resemble Western Europe. Uh, very similar to some of the things that were going on in Western Europe, R uh, Russia begins to adopt things like eating with silverware, cutting your beards, wearing uh, new kinds of clothing, and so on and so forth, as well as building palaces and exerting absolutism and so on. So they, they build a more modern military, uh, they build a navy for the first time, they have a state bureaucracy uh, with a system of nobles who are loyal to the king as well as other servants. Uh, and then they have this emerging concept of interest in the state as separate from the Tsar's interest, which means that the Tsar, when he issues these decrees, he also began issuing explanations to his decrees to gain popular support. Rather than just ruling arbitrarily, he would offer rationale for the reason why certain decrees were being passed. And this gains him some popular support, along with the fact that he, of course, is contributing so heavily to so many different avenues of development for Russia during this time. Now, before I close for the lecture for today, I do want to just quickly remind you that uh, for the remainder of the day today, um, I do have a couple of assignments that I'm going to be putting up for you. We only have about 13 more questions on the reading guide. Um, I'm going to be posting a... Um, a, uh, a couple of online quizzes for you that you'll be able to do for today um, and get those done by Friday. Uh, we are coming up towards the end of this unit. What we will do on Friday is um, the last remaining questions of the reading guide uh, for, for, the, uh, for the chapter 15 reading guide. Um, they're all related to constitutionalism in the Dutch Republic, which if you recall, we've actually learned about that already because it feels awkward to go back and talk about England and the Dutch Republic when we've already been talking about stuff that happens in the like early 1700s and then to jump all the way back and talk about England and the Dutch Republic in the, in the late 15 and early 1600s kind of seems a little bit out of place. So I've actually already done a lecture on those things back when we were in the last unit, unit three. But I'm gonna go over some of those topics again just to kind of remind you, uh, reinitiate some of these past learnings from, from, uh, from the last unit about constitutionalism because remember that absolutism doesn't take place in England um, or in uh, the Dutch Republic. And so they look a little different than the rest of absolutist Europe at this time either in Western Europe or Eastern Europe, 
uh, many of which were all absolutist, but the English are different as well as the Dutch, and so we'll review some of those concepts, but we are coming up close to the end of this unit here. I suspect that we will probably be taking the test for absolutism next Wednesday, idea being that we'll do some review of concepts of const constitutionalism on Friday and talking about that. And then on Monday of next week, we will be doing some review assignments, going over the unit, making sure that you have the opportunity to finish up all the things that you need to do. And then we'll probably be taking the test for absolutism unit four uh, on uh, next Wednesday. And do, do know that there will be questions pertaining to um, England, constitutionalism, the Dutch Republic on this exam. Even though I know we taught it last unit, there were no questions on that last unit really. So um, this, un this unit will be the one where you probably see some questions about like the English Civil War, um, Thomas Hobbes and people like that that we've already learned about, but that we will be uh, re reiterating on Friday. Also, one last comment before I let you go is that I will be posting in the coming days, um, uh, we're coming up on Halloween here in the next 10 days, um, I have an assignment that I've been doing for the last several years uh, where I have a documentary um, uh, that I will, um, uh, I don't know if, you, if it's still up or not, I'll have to check and see, but basically it's called Witches, A Century of Murder, and I'll just let you know that there are some parts of the documentary that are a little intense, okay, so I'm just letting you know that off the bat, and I know that you're 10th graders, um, but it, it the, you know, the documentary is really interesting because it, it gives you an insight as to why witch hunts, um, witchcraft, burning witches at the stake, all of that sort of thing was even a thing at all. And a lot of it had to do with the declining influence of Calvinism after the, um, after the Thirty Years War. And so, you know, when, when, religious, when the last religious war of Europe ends um, and religion is declining and people are increasingly challenging the church authority because of the scientific revolution that's happening, um, what ends up happening is that um, you, you see a reaction from the church to try to reestablish control. And one of the ways that that happens is essentially subjugation of women. And, um, and so, you know, Europe was alre already patriarchal, but the church especially was super, super patriarchal and had a vested interest in trying to retain control over society. And so what you end up seeing during the 1600s, um, throughout the 1600s, really all the way up to the late 1600s, 1680s, 1690s, um, you know, with the Salem witch trials, for example, even in the United States, we see witch trials. Um, or what becomes the United States. It wasn't the U.S. at the time. It was still British colonies. But the point to say is that um, this documentary has to do with, uh, with, with, with essentially witchcraft and, and witch hunts and stuff like that. And like I say, I'm just going to let you know some of it is pretty intense, okay? Um, but I've assigned it several years in the past, and it's never been an issue before. So um, I, I don't think it'll be an issue for you guys. Just use discretion and remember that what you're watching is history, right? It's, it's um, you know, if, we, if there's one thing that we need more of these days, it's people appreciating the facts and not just brushing facts under the rug because it makes them uncomfortable. Um, you know, uh, we have too much misinformation spreading around these days and, uh, and you know, at the, at the sake of maybe being a little bit intense sometimes, I'd rather uh, tell you the truth about things rather than pull punches or, or give you a false idea of, of, of reality. So um, anyhow, folks, uh, be on the lookout for that uh, extra credit assignment, which will be posted in the coming days here. There will be very explicit instructions about how to go about completing this extra credit assignment. It is obviously optional. You do not have to do it, but it's just an opportunity uh, to make up some lost ground if you feel like you've missed quite a few assignments or something like that, um, you're more than welcome to do the, the extra credit opportunity. Of course, the number one thing that you can always do to improve your grade is just to make sure that you're getting your regular assignments on, on time. Extra credit really shouldn't be the priority. You should be focusing on the things that are actually assigned because those things, there's a lot more of them, first of all, obviously, over the course of the semester. And then also, um, you know, in, in the long run, those are going to have the, the biggest impact on your grade is just staying on top of things. So 
um, just keep on doing what you're doing. Try and stay organized and um, you know, be, be reviewing stuff from this unit. It's a pretty big unit, so there's a lot of stuff to cover. And other than that, um, I, will, uh, I will sign off here, and I just want to wish you guys all a, a wonderful Wednesday and a great rest of the week here, and I'll see you back on Friday morning. Have a great day, kids.